Has Viktor Orban killed democracy in Hungary? I'll ask the international spokesperson for the Hungarian government. I'm Mark Lamont Hill. Also on the show, the United States Congress is reviewing legislation that would consider paying money to the descendants of enslaved Africans. Could such reparations ever happen? And are they the best way to remedy these historical injustices? That's our debate. But first, Hungary's crackdown on media, minorities, and political institutions has set Prime Minister Viktor Orban on a collision course with the EU. So is the country's relationship with Brussels salvageable? Or is it damaged beyond repair? I'll ask Hungary's Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, this week's headliner, Zoltan Kovac. Zoltan Kovac, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Hello. A quarter of Hungary's population has received at least one shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so the government is now easing restrictions, they're opening things up, which makes sense, except that Right now, Hungary has also one of the highest per capita COVID death rates in the world in recent weeks. Hospitals are inundated with patients. Doctors are begging you, essentially, not to ease up restrictions. Why aren't you listening to doctors? Well, first of all, let me suggest to you that, uh, yes, indeed, uh, the numbers are still high. Uh, but the nature of the third wave is very much different from the previous two. And that's why we have decided that uh, a new strategy is uh, required. It's obvious that the, the British strain, as it is being called, cannot be stopped by restrictions. Uh, that's the lesson everybody learns around the globe. The only way out uh, of this crisis in general and in specific in face of the uh, uh, British variant is uh, vaccination. So we're speeding up vaccination. But, but Mr. Kovac, I'm, I'm, a I'm a little confused here. Doctors are saying don't do this. Uh, in fact, uh, Judith Toff, she's vice president of the Hungarian Labor Union of Doctors, said doctors find it incomprehensible how there can be a communication about a reopening so soon just when we should be talking about tightening and how to improve adherence to existing curbs. I understand the idea of using a different strategy. What I don't understand is why is there a gap between what the government is doing and what so many doctors are saying? Uh, rightly, you uh, say that many, uh, but not all. And very definitely, when a strategy is being formulated, uh, it's not only the healthcare element, actually, which is uh, taken into consideration. The Hungarian hospital system is prepared, uh, can care with the burden it is carrying. Uh, we have to take care of those actually who were about or lost their jobs. Uh, so uh, reigniting, restarting the economy is another must. And also uh, to the mental uh, uh, health of Hungarians who, because of the restrictions, not being able to go to school, uh, not being able to go to work because they, they have to take care of their children, uh, a new strategy is required. I think part of the challenge, uh, Mr. Kovac, though, is as you're describing uh, the circumstances around vaccinations and the circumstances around the pandemic, it's hard for us as a public to have a clear sense of what's going on because journalists aren't being allowed to report on this properly. Uh, Non-state media is not allowed in the hospitals. Uh, doctors are not being permitted to speak to the press. Same for nurses. Uh, 28 media organizations wrote to your government at the end of last month demanding greater transparency and access to hospitals for journalists who are covering COVID-19. Why aren't you giving them access? Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, the hospitals have to deal with what uh, they are signed for, and that is uh, treating their patients uh, and uh, taking care of those who are in need. Uh, very definitely, we uh, provide access uh, through those channels we've been using for the past year. There's no change in protocol. What All channels media, are those? Uh, it is uh, the uh, the public service radio and television actually, which is uh, giving uh, 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 all the reports on a daily basis about the vaccination progress, about uh, uh, our hospitals, about the heroic uh, fight that is going on in the hospitals. It's simply not true. We see the efforts actually, especially from the anti-government press that they would like to come in and uh, go for sensational news. But definitely, this is not what Hungarians uh, and especially those in the hospitals are required. They, and I mean, doctors and nurses uh, have the right, obviously, um, uh, in face of what you're suggesting, to tell their opinion outside the hospital. Very definitely, the hospitals are there to treat the patients, not for media purposes. Wait, so that I'm clear, you're saying doctors and nurses are permitted to speak to the media? 
Sure, and nobody, nobody restricts that. I mean, official statement, obviously, uh, like in any other country, when it's about or on behalf of a hospital or on behalf of officials, is is uh, um, going according to protocol, uh, which is again not a Hungarian invention, uh, but an international one. And everybody is free to tell their opinion and what they see uh, outside the hospitals. The hospitals are there for treating the patients, not for media purposes. And, and so. The idea that the media restrictions are purely based on medical need would make sense, except, sir, that there are so many other uh, concerns about media freedom in the country. Since 2010, uh, when Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban came to power, uh, we've effectively seen a complete takeover over the majority of the country's media. O on top of this, he, has, he had the Constitution rewritten in a way that Human Rights Watch said, quote, weakened legal checks on its authority, interfered with media freedom, undermined human rights protections, uh, judicial independence, and political participation. How can we make sense of this, particularly if we're thinking through a lens of democracy? Look, uh, the list of uh, core words uh, you've used are very nice. Uh, and very obviously we all uh, take care of them, because that's probably the dearest from the perspective of democracy. But these, uh, these code words, these uh, allegations, I mean, the lack of uh, media freedom and so on, is coming from the vocabulary of the political opposition for the past 10 years. We all know that it's simply not true. Uh, we, therefore, uh, since it's a political issue rather than a real democracy issue in any way, we don't take care of these allegations anymore. Uh, because, it, again, they are simply not true. Look, among the situation okay, so, we Can you are, be more specific, sir? Because you're saying we all know they're simply not true, but media organizations are saying they're true. Human rights organizations are saying they're true. It's estimated now that 90 percent of all media in Hungary is now directly or indirectly controlled uh, by Viktor Orban's party. That's a fact, correct? Why not 100? I'm sorry? I mean, uh, why not 100 percent, I mean? Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. I mean, <laughs> the thing is... I mean, anti-democratic humor is fine, but, but the question still is, is that if, would, would, no, do, you, do, you, do you acknowledge that 90 percent is, is controlled by, by the party? Sure, but I think uh, one good sign of democracy is that we can joke about issues uh, which, is, which are laughable. I mean, the charges are laughable, not what you are saying or suggesting, but what uh, our political opposition domestically is trying to suggest. Uh, that's been a buzzword for the past uh, 10, 11 years by now, actually. They've been bombarding not only Hungarian public opinion, but the international public opinion with these charges. Year by year, they praise about, they worry about uh, the damis, uh, the going away of Hungarian media freedom. This is simply not true. The, the estimate you have uh, mentioned is far too exaggerating in, in any respect. Very obviously, very obviously, uh, compared to, say, the Western European uh, media balance, where it's very rare to hear any kind of uh, conservative Christian democratic opinion anymore. Uh, it's a refreshing uh, um, um, uh, situation and uh, experience here in Hungary that uh, at least there is some kind of balance. Viktor Orban himself has referred to Hungary as an illiberal democracy. Do you share that assessment? He never referred to Hungary as an illiberal uh, uh, democracy. Uh, that's a buzzword, that's a description that has been formulated and put on us by the Western European press. Back long, long years ago, maybe eight years ago, the prime minister can, can, was can I, can, I pause, can I pause you for one second? So I know you said that he never said that, uh, but I'm going to quote him for a moment from a speech he gave uh, in 2014. He said, the Hungarian nation is not a simple sum of individuals, but a community that needs to be organized, strengthened, and developed. And in this sense, the new state that we are building is an illiberal state, a non-liberal state. And now that you understand that he said this, do you share this assessment? Sure. Sure, he did two years after the whole thing was fabricated by the Western European press. We are proudly liberals because that means we are non liberals as the Prime Minister. I'm sorry, just for clarity, and you're saying. Non -liberal, I'm sorry. Non liberal means that we have the freedom to have a different kind of political opinion and po uh, political conviction, namely Christian democracy. Christian democracy is not a liberal democracy or a, uh, a liberal democratic perception. Uh, it's a long debate. Um, I'm ready to engage in that, actually, but it's going to take hours, actually, uh, when I'm convincing you that, while I'm convincing you that the use of liberal 
in the Anglo-Saxon world, not to talk about the United States or the UK, is going to be completely different from what we use here in Central Europe. So non-liberal would be the, uh, uh, the, the good description, actually, uh, as the prime minister means it. And I believe uh, any vindication that there's only one way, one form of democracy called liberal is simply wrong and not true. Uh, but your assertion that human rights aren't being uh, compromised, that personal and individual freedoms and liberties aren't being undermined, seems to stand at odds with what we're seeing here. Uh, your government has used emergency powers to pass a law uh, criminalizing criticism of the government's response to the pandemic. It put a total ban on protests, it ended legal recognition for trans people, and it banned same-sex couples from adopting children. Yeah, but the accumulation of uh, non-relating news and the items, uh, uh, as you suggested from your list of uh, allegations, uh, has nothing to do with what you are uh, trying to question here. Uh, the, the measures uh, that are in place uh, were and are in place for the pandemic uh, obviously come uh, in a form uh, that is similar to any uh, Western European or global uh, approach to an effective measure, uh, measure system by which it is possible to handle the situation. Uh, spreading fake news about the pandemic uh, is as dangerous in the UK, in uh, the United States, in the Arabic world, as, in, as it is in Hungary. And if it's a lie, and if it stirs up public uh, um, uh, unrest, should be uh, persecuted. That's the only meaning. The other elements actually but, of sir, your sir, list. This concern uh, <laughs> isn't just being articulated, though, by people in Hungary. It's not just being expressed by uh, people at human rights organizations. Uh, the EU, more broadly, many of your fellow members have expressed concern about Hungary's uh, ability to follow uh, a commitment to following the rule of law, a common value, of course, enshrined in Article 2 of the EU's founding treaty. Uh, a disciplinary process against Hungary was launched in 2018, and now the threat of financial sanctions is looming. How do you respond to those nations, those fellow members, those entities, who say that you're not following rule of law? Well, uh, I believe the Hungarian stance is very clear on that. Don't question us on issues uh, we all agree. And if you have uh, any allegations, if you have any doubt, uh, then use those channels that can independently and objectively judge the situation. There's no such system in place in the European Union yet. Uh, the political left, uh, the left and liberals, the Greens, use uh, the rule of law uh, as a buzzword, uh, as a matter of fact, as a, as a political weapon against those they don't like. And that's the worrying uh, element, actually, one of the most worrying elements of uh, the development of Western European politics for the past couple of years, uh, that uh, in the name of democracy, they are sacrificing the meaning of words uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, if you like, uh, rhetoric uh, for the sake of their, their own political goals. Just the very fact that we don't agree uh, um, philosophically uh, from no, the but, perspective but these are, of but these political... Aren't, but these aren't, these aren't philosophical not, issues. Exactly. But, but, sir, these aren't philosophical issues being raised. They were, they were broader concerns about, about the rule of law, specifically the independence of judiciary, corruption and conflicts of interest, freedom of expression, academic freedom. I, I, would, I would imagine you would say that, that the right also wants these things, right? And the fact that they're saying that you are not honoring this would suggest that this isn't an ideological war, perhaps. Rather, this is a question of whether the rule of law is being followed. What do you say to that? It's a very nice list of allegations. Uh, the only real issue is that if you talk about the rule of law, uh, if you believe that something is wrong, then you have to substantiate it and prove that it is wrong. Um, so far, uh, for the past 10 years, uh, not really anybody succeeded that because most of the uh, uh, foundations for those allegations are coming from a different political conviction. Uh, the difference in political opinion cannot substantiate or cannot serve as a ground for uh, not true, and that is uh, um, untrue allegations just because of the difference of political opinion. We. Uh, so, uh, 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 conservatives, that is, Christian Democrats, opine, believe, and act differently than liberals. And that freedom is provided by the will of the people. That's so simple. Uh, in Hungary, three consecutive elections, the government has gained two-thirds support on behalf of the population and in terms of the mandates in parliament. That's a clear-cut indication of how and what the Hungarian people are opining and what uh, trust they have given to the government. Zoltan Kovac, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you.
40 acres and a mule. That was the promise that was made to newly freed African Americans in 1865 at the end of the U.S. Civil War, a form of reparations for the atrocities of slavery. But it didn't take long for the promise to be broken. Just a year later, President Andrew Johnson reversed the order, leaving the formerly enslaved with no form of restitution. Some argue that this marked the beginning of the contemporary racial wealth gap in the United States. Today, according to some estimates, 40 acres and a mule will be the equivalent of about two and a half trillion dollars. Congress is currently reviewing a bill on reparations first introduced in 1989 known as H.R. 40, which would set up a commission to examine remedies for slavery, such as payments from the government to descendants of enslaved Africans. So should reparations take place? And if so, what would that look like? Joining us to discuss this are Barbara Ransby, professor of African-American studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago and author of Making All Black Lives Matter, and Jared Ball, professor of communication and Africana studies at Morgan State University and the author of The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. I want to thank you both uh, for joining me in the arena. Uh, Barbara, I want to start with you. Uh, what does it mean when we say reparations? And I know that's a broad question. People have different ideas about what that means. But can you explain a little bit in your estimation of how what reparations is or what it should be and, and how it would work? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the area of of debate and, and struggle, right? Um, there are a number of models for reparations, all of them limited and problematic, uh, if you will. Uh, we think of reparations as repair, as redress for past harm and past grievance. So um, the reason I think the reparations demand is a useful one in, in the constellation of uh, tactics that we might use in the Black Freedom Movement is that it really does, at the, on the bottom line, indict racial capitalism which was built on the backs of, uh, of black people with stolen land and stolen labor. Uh, it is something that we still do not confront. It is uh, you know, a, a part of a very bloody history that, um, that a whole uh, elaborate narrative of American triumphalism you know, uh, covers over. So, so I think it's a way to both expose racial capitalism as well as uh, confront some of the material realities uh, of, of white supremacy uh, today. Jared, you have said, and, and I want to begin here because, you know, sometimes we see in mainstream media the reparations debate, and it becomes the person who supports reparations and represents like 80 percent of the black community. And then there's that there's the conservative person who's propped up uh, to represent the infinitesimal number of black people who actually oppose it. Um, and that's not what we're doing here. You begin from the place of saying black people deserve reparations. You're concerned about whether reparations uh, would ultimately be uh, more damaging than beneficial as a tactic or a strategy. Can you talk a little bit uh, about what you mean when you say that? Well, sure. Uh, to the extent uh, that any issue can be turned on its side and, and made conservative, this is certainly one of them. And uh, I think in many ways the reparations argument has been welcomed uh, by conservative uh, segments of uh, the political and media apparatus, even the academic apparatus in the United States, um, because it, it doesn't challenge capital. It allows for, in many ways, what we saw after the election of Barack Obama, it allows for much of white America to simply say, well, we can wipe our hands of, of, of these issues and move on. What I think should be the primary concern for any group, any oppressed group, and no more among them than, than uh, black people in the United States, that is the assumption of political power. And we need to be organizing for uh, a, a change of this society in ways that would make this conversation moot. Um, the call for reparations has been going on, as you noted in your intro, since, you know, uh, in some ways for a long time and officially, at least within the halls of Congress in terms of this H.R. 40 since 1989. And it has gone nowhere, uh, largely because the society not only is bent on, uh, you know, accumulating wealth from the, the extraction of labor and particularly black labor in this country, uh, but also because there's no no will among the the you know roughly two thirds of the voting population that would be required to start passing the kinds of legislation that would start redistributing wealth just to Black Americans when in fact we see the society doesn't even want to redistribute even pennies back to its own white citizens even in the in a moment of COVID crisis so th that's really what I think I think we need to be thinking much bigger anyway in terms of debt cancellation redistribution of the gr gross domestic product all of that kind of stuff so. But can I, can I just respond to Jared? You know, but it doesn't have to be either or. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the, all of what you say is, is true. And every 
reform demand we make is co-optable. Um, every reform demand is limited. Uh, but you know, this is a reform demand. If we see it as a revolutionary demand, we're misguided. But in the context of a reform demand, it does have the, exp uh, the potential to expose uh, racial capitalism because what it says is that these, uh, the, the bloody beginnings of this country, that, that American capitalism was built with stolen labor uh, and stolen land, and that, that it indicts it for that in a very, very profoundly and uh, profound and fundamental way. And to do that disrupts a whole narrative, I think, that justifies capitalism in, 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 in the present day. Um, if it is our only strategy is problematic, if it's a strategy that doesn't factor in class disparities in the black community and the role of black elites, it's a problem. But if it doesn't do that, like any other reform, it, it provides an opportunity to, uh, uh, to provide some material relief to our people who are indeed suffering. Uh, and it provides the opportunity to uh, discursively indict uh, the you know, capitalist system, which I think we both are, are critics of and spent much of our lives um, seeking to dismantle. Jared, you said something that's fascinating and that I think may get you in trouble, at least on the Internet, if, you know, as, as real a place as that might be. Uh, you said that tactically, if you want to get reparations, it, sh it should be collective and not specific uh, to any one group because, quote, you could argue that white working people have a history of being exploited, indigenous people have been exploited, Latinos have been exploited. There are people who are going to say to you and who have said to you, that this deflects from the issue that black Americans were enslaved and that we need to have a conversation and public policy that is targeted to them. And to lump all those exploited people together is to do a disservice to the descendants of enslaved Africans here in the United States. What do you say to that? First of all, I say that that's a logical and sound response to my personal critique and suggestion. I get that. Um, I'm not so, so and, and usually the response to my suggestion is that, is often at least, as you pointed out, to suggest that I'm not in defense or support of black people getting reparations uh, or the particular uh, and individual and specific struggle that black people have suffered here in this country. That's not at all the, the case. Again, my point is just tactically, uh, tactically speaking. We should be focused on something bigger like, hmm. like a debt jubilee. Like, let's cancel debt. Imagine if uh, your student loan debt is wiped out, your, your Medicare and med well, medical coverage is entirely covered, uh, you, you know, schooling is free, you know, all of this, you know, if all of these basic minimums are just caught up to in terms of what is, you know, the case for much of the so-called advanced world, uh, then we're ahead you of know, the, the next level of what black people could get reparatively would be even, I think, even stronger. And, and the, the ability to politically organize for more would be even more advanced and stronger. So that's all I'm simply trying to, to, to suggest, that it's, it's a tactical question, not one uh, of, of, of des deserving. Of merit, or, right. Yeah. Merit. And, uh, Thank yeah, all, that, all that's not mutually exclusive, though, is it? I mean, you're still asking the federal government. No, know, no. In the context of reform, but, 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 but you're still point, asking the federal sure. government. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm you sorry. Just... I, what, you, you're right. What I'm, but I'm really what I'm arguing for is an assumption of political power that would make a request to the federal government moot in the same way that those yeah. who, who handed themselves trillions last summer to make up for the lack of consumer spending among those of us in a, in a, in a COVID crisis were able to do. If you have political power, you just redistribute the nation's wealth to where it's needed and those yeah. who need it the most yeah. will get it. And that's sort of really the kind yeah. of focus that I'm talking Barbara, about. Jump on so, in. Yeah. for instance, it, so, yeah, sorry, I was to give Barbara a chance yeah, to, that's to a revolution. Revolution. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, and that's a revolutionary vision, right? Which which we share. We're not there yet. So I think you know when we talk about uh, tactically, you know, there are things that we might demand tactically that we know are not realizable in the framework of the current system. It serves a certain function. It serves to mobilize people. It serves to raise consciousness. It serves to expose certain contradictions, et cetera. So so tactically, there are demands that are made all the time that we think are not likely to be won in their totality. So. Yeah. You know, Jared makes the argument that there's conservative elements that want to embrace uh, reparations, but reparations has been resisted also, as you pointed out. You know, even the discussion of reparations has been resisted, you know, since uh, Conyers brought up H.R. 40. And in 2001, right before the 9-11, in Durban, the two issues that U.S. and Israel walked out on were not just Palestine, one was Palestine, uh, but the other was reparations. And so I think it does have a radical potential. Uh, it doesn't automatically become a radical demand, but it does have a radical potential both for material uh, support for people suffering, but also to um, expose the corruption of racial capitalism. So, so that's why I think it's useful. I don't think it's a panacea. So 
Absolutely. I think and, that's where I live. And I know there's so much more to cover here. This is a very nuanced and complicated topic, and we'll make sure you have you, have you back to talk about it even more. But I want to thank you both for joining me in the arena. Barbara Ransby, Jared Ball, thank you so much. Anytime. All right, thank you. That's our show for the week. But up front, we'll be back next week. Take care.